Hello my dear friends. I am so excited to be sharing with you a very special video that's recently appeared on my partner David Warner Matheson's YouTube channel. I thought that it was just so important that I wanted to share it here on the Guiding Star Astrology YouTube channel as well. David and I did a combined talk and discussion about Venus cycles and how Venus cycles through the heavens, looking at the celestial mechanics of how that happens. And we also took a look at the ancient sunstone, which may very well be uh, mistitled and perhaps should be called the ancient Venus stone. You're going to want to check this out. It is such an exciting, exciting video. I'm really glad to be able to share it with you here. I'd also encourage you, if you haven't already done so, do check out David's YouTube channel called The Undying Stars. You can look in your YouTube under David Warner Matheson or The Undying Stars, or you can go to the link in the description box below to pop over to David's YouTube channel, like, share, and subscribe what you find there. But you'll find so much ancient knowledge and wisdom about celestial mechanics, about mythologies, and how they tie into the things we look at here on my channel, planets, cycles, uh, systems of celestial mechanics, etc. It's so important that we know this background information about the, the astronomy and the astrology that we utilize. So pop over to David's channel, check it out. There's so much there that's going to just blow your mind. But in the meantime, enjoy this video all about Venus. And there's never been a better time for this video to be put out there because it's um, currently Venus retrograde. And that's a very, very important retrograde cycle that we'll be talking about in this video. Now, not only that, I just want to conclude this little introductory piece by saying David and I are both going to be attending the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge this October in Palm Springs. And we are so excited to be going there. David will be speaking all about ancient wisdom and ancient knowledge. But for those who aren't aware, this Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge is actually all about the cycles of the ages or otherwise known as the yugas we're currently in the kali yuga there are four others um, and it's a very very important topic that is discussed at this conference um, and this this year's conference includes graham hancock amongst many other well-known um, presenters check out the link in the description box below to the website um, all about this particular event and it's just so exciting to be going and to be being there we're looking at ancient knowledge, we're looking at the cycles of the ages at this conference, we're looking at ancient wisdom and how it pertains to our lives today. You don't want to miss this. Come meet us, come join us at this really exciting event. And of course, the sunstone that we are going to be exploring in this video ties in a lot to this um, ancient wisdom, ancient knowledge that we can garner so much from in today's age. So enjoy the video. Don't forget to pop, pop over to David's channel and check out all his wonderful information there and come meet us both at this year's Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. I'll see you there. Hello, Ksenia. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? I'm good. Are you ready to talk about the cycles of the heavens? I'm so excited to talk about the cycles of the heavens, particularly Venus, which is what we're going to be looking at today, and some ancient um, ideas around Venus cycles. Well, the cycles of the heavens are obviously very important to the world's myths around the world. The world's ancient myths are based on the stars and heavenly cycles, and I believe that the heavenly cycles are important in astrology as well. Oh, just a little bit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, They're very important. So I thought today what we'll do, I'm going to actually, could you clap your hands and I'm going to press record when you clap your hands whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm recording the screen. So what I have here is the cycles of the heavens as we see them from Earth. I thought this would be the most logical place to start is to actually watch the cycles of the heavens on this screen for a few cycles just to get familiar with what we're talking about and see it from Earth's perspective first and then we can zoom out and try and talk about what might be causing that. I'm going to roll the sun back to noon and as you can see we're located in the southern hemisphere on this Stellarium. So we're in Australia 
and the sun is going across the northern we have to look to the north to watch the sun's path whereas in California you would have to look to the south but so the sun at noon is over north and what I'm going to do is keep it over north I'm just going to advance one day at a time and you can watch that black object that just f keeps flying by that's the moon so this is the middle of the day but when the moon is lapping the sun it makes a new moon so each time it goes in front of the sun it's a new moon so we're actually watching basically the moon coming up to new moon each each mm -hmm. time so mm -hmm. every month the moon and the sun conjunct and it's called a synod that's a term that you might be familiar with if you're Presbyterian or something they have a synod it means a meeting of all the elders but it isn't it interesting that the mm. term in church is based on actually the terms that you use for the conjunction of planets and stars so when the moon passes right directly in front of the Sun that's a synod and so you could measure a synodic period of the moon and we're going to talk about that because it turns out that the synodic periods of the moon are related to the synodic periods of Venus. Mm -hmm. So first we're watching the, the moon. Now let's shift our attention to Venus. You can see it over here. As we look, I'm pointing with my finger to the left side of the sun, which is the west side of the sun as we're looking to the north. And you can see Venus is getting closer and closer to the sun. It's about to have either an inferior conjunction or a superior conjunction and I believe this one is a inferior where it's passing in front of mm -hmm. the Sun mm -hmm. yes. and, and you call that Kazemi, that Kazemi right? in astrology that's right whereas when it passes behind the Sun as it will do shortly here on the screen it's known as a, a combustion um, mm. it goes combust so you can see it gets a little smaller mm. what's happening is it's we're going to see this from a different angle outside of the Earth in a little bit, but I just want to just look at the cycles of Venus from our perspective on Earth. Now, what we're seeing is the Sun getting closer to the horizon, and then... And now Venus is moving what appears to be yeah, backwards. And right, there's your retrograde. Yeah. So, so that conjunct was actually a combust. That, I mean, uh, a Kazemi, because in retrograde is when it's in front. That's correct. It's, it's closest to us. Okay, so so let's just watch it. Right now, it's going back to prograde. So you can see that it is moving eastward across the constellations. It's, it's moving towards Libra. So it's going in the same direction that the sun moves through them, so that's called prograde. Or what would you call it in astrology? Direct motion. Direct. So it's direct motion. Right now, Venus is still direct or prograde. So that was a, a, a combustion it went conjunction behind, that right, we had then? It went behind the sun from our perspective. Now it's about to turn retrograde. So watch it. Can you see it? Yeah. I left the labels on to make it no, a little bit easier. Helpful. Still direct. Still direct. Oh wait. Yeah, Interrupt it's that. Backwards. It's going retrograde. So yep. you can now it's gonna it's going retrograde. It goes in front of the sun. That's Kazemi. Yes. That's an interior conjunction. It's also called, and it just stopped going retrograde. So how long does it go retrograde? Forty days. Forty days. Very significant in myth and ancient scriptures and sacred stories. Now it's going prograde again or direct again. <laughs>
something that people might notice uh, of interest here too is you can see that each time Venus passes the Sun sometime it is sometimes it's actually directly in front of the Sun mm. and sometimes it's sitting a bit below the Sun or maybe on occasion a bit above the Sun that relates to um, uh, declination and the declination point of Venus which is something that some astrological programs do provide for you can look that up um, but that also has an effect on on um, the influence astrologically upon us here on earth if Venus is in a, a, a low declination it, it can still sometimes be visible even though it's in a, a what we call a conjunction so you really it depends on where you sit on the earth as to what you're actually seeing in the sky too um, but yes, I just thought I'd mention that declination is very, very important. So this is, it's really, it's beautiful to watch it. And it's really, I think, instructive to watch the motions of the planets. What we're, what we're basically watching is from one day to the next. So each time this screen advances is 24 hours. This is the motion of the planets. We're keeping the sun basically at noon every day. And it would be the same thing if I had a Northern Hemisphere perspective. I just left it in Australia this time uh, to help me get more familiar with the skies down here. <laughs> They're so different. Um, so there it is. So that 263 as the evening star, 50 days behind the sun, 263 as the morning star, eight days lost in the glare as it comes in front of the sun adds up to the synodic cycle of venus so venus will go directly in front of the sun once every 584 days we don't count we we, we count the synods from when it goes in front not in front and in back so That's correct. each yeah. it, we'll, we'll start our you could start the counter anywhere on the cycle but the easiest place to count it is when it's right in front of the sun when it's Kazemi, Kazemi. Mm -hmm. that's our starting point the inferior conjunction and those would be synods that would be a meeting a synod a meeting of all these different heavenly bodies in this case the heavenly bodies that are meeting in the sky are Venus and the Sun but they're actually lined up with the earth so it's a synod it's a meeting of the Sun the earth and Venus so what we'll see is that the synodic periods of the moon and the synodic period of Venus are very closely coordinated and in fact as it turns out according to the arguments of Simon Schack that we've been talking about with the Tychos the moon's synodic period is lined up with all of the planets but it's especially beautiful with Venus and the ancient Aztec and the ancient Toltec who came before the Aztec possibly the Aztecs talked about the Toltecs seem to have known about this conjunction not they they knew about this conjunction but they seem to have known about it in a very precise and sophisticated way and incorporated that into the Sunstone which is what we're going to show so I will stop um, showing that and now I'm going to go to some slides that talk about the Moon's Synod. This is from Simon Schack's free online book, the Tycho's book, where he is arguing that the Moon is the central drive shaft of the solar system, but he also argues that a lot of people have missed this because the synodic period, the true synodic period of the Moon, turns out to be 29.22 days. And it, that's from conjunction with the sun to conjunction with the sun. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the synodic cycle of the moon is, is um, the time, the days between conjunction with the sun. That's right. So 29.22. But if you put out that number, as he explains here, you have to figure out the true mean or average synodic period he calls it the TMSP of the moon and he argues that it's 29.22 if you look on a long enough cycle and there is what he explains right here is that there's this remarkable set of periods where the moon comes back to a realignment with the Sun in 65 years and if you average that out if you figure out the 
the number, the average synodic period of the moon's conjunctions with the sun over a 65-year time period, you get 29.53 days for the average. But then he says, but the metonic cycle, where the moon lines up again with the sun in a 19-year period, which was definitely known to the ancients, mm -hmm. you get 28.91 days. And if you take those two and you average those out, then you get to 29.22. And you might say, why would you go to so much trouble? It's because the moon has a, a longer synodic period interval, a long synodic interval, and then it has a short synodic interval and it does both of these. And so if you really wanna to get to the true mean synodic period, the average, you have to take into account the long and the short and the Aztec appear to have known that if you average those two out, you get to 29.22 days. And it turns out that the ancient Aztec sunstone or the Aztec themselves may have gotten it from the related people that were before them that they called the Toltecs or the builders. That Toltec or Aztec sunstone that's so famous incorporates this 29, 22 day period, which is really interesting. We'll see a little bit about it in a minute, but let's continue. Let me show a little bit about the harmonies in the solar system. This is this beautiful book, the little book of coincidence in the solar system. It's by John Martineau. Mm -hmm. He's in England. He has a whole series of books that are called wooden books. Yeah, wooden books. He makes these these beautiful little books that talk about in such an elegant way all these different um, natural harmonies. And this one's about the harmonies in the solar system. Now, he's not using the Tycho's model. Um, I'm not going to really get too into the Tycho's model. I've got a whole <laughs> long yes, video. If you want us to check out um, information about the Tycho's model, which is basically the premise that the solar system is not functioning in the way, the, the traditional Copernican way that we have been taught in school. And it's very much worth checking this out because the science behind it is irrefutable. Um, and David has a number of fabulous videos on his YouTube channel that explore that. So do check out his interviews with Simon and Patrick from the Tychos system. And we'll show a little bit about, I'll show a little bit of animations from it as we're talking about Venus here. But from the perspective of Earth, which is what we were just looking at in the planetarium, these are the cycles. Mm. What is going on in the gears of heaven to create those cycles can be argued about. I believe that the Tychos model has an abundance of very solid evidence to argue that those are the gears that the, the gears are laid out more the way Tycho Brahe and then Simon Shack has updated Tycho's model into his Tycho's model with along with Patrick. Those arrangements of the gears make a lot of sense and we'll see that when you understand it with that arrangement of the gears, these harmonies become much easier to explain and understand and they make a lot more sense and it shows that everything is connected this whole gearbox is connected whereas in this book by John Martineau he shows these beautiful harmonies patterns like, and yeah so and, and and he says here there must be a reason for this beautiful fit between he's talking on this page about the orbits of mercury and venus and they have all these ways in which they harmonize he says there must be some reason for this beautiful fit but none is yet known perhaps some bright 21st century scientists will explain it until then it remains a beautiful coincidence so uh, throughout this book he's showing you all these coincidences all these harmonies within the gears of heaven the way they're all fitting mm -hmm. together and according to the Copernican theory and the way that we're taught in school, well, it's all just, you know, this is just the way Random. the rocks uh, mm -hmm. all started to spin around the sun and, you know. But here, like for my followers, we know like things are connected, like astrology speaks to that, you know, that there is no random coincidence, that everything has influence and bearing upon one another. And uh, that's why the, to me, the Tychos model is intriguing because it speaks to everything being connected. There are no coincidences and everything is interacting with each other. And uh, maybe by magnetism, 
gravity, other, other measurements as well, but uh, magnetism is a key one. And therefore, it explains astrology and why everything uh, affects us the way it does, because everything is connected. And so the next page in this book is about Venus. So the first page that I showed is about Mercury and Venus and all these amazing harmonies that they have between their orbits. And then Venus, and this basically speaks to harmonies between the Earth and Venus. He says, the kiss of Venus, our most beautiful relationship. He says, other than the sun and the moon, the brightest point in the sky is Venus. That's the brightest object in our sky. She can actually cast shadows on the Earth which is something that only the two other luminaries have the ability to do. So she's superior above planets in that regard. And she is locked in this beautiful relationship with the Earth, and as we'll see, with the Moon. And so we'll talk about that in a moment. But to read from John Martineau's book here, he says, other than the Sun and the Moon, the brightest point in the sky is Venus, morning and evening star. She is our closest neighbor, kissing us every 584 days so that's that synodic cycle 584 days and we'll see we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment kissing us every 584 days as she passes between us and the sun so that's the conjunction that is called kazemi when she's an inferior conjunction in other words between us uh, and the sun as opposed to the what Astro uh, astronomers call a superior when she's uh, beyond, the, beyond sun. the sun, the other side. So he's talking about the same Kazemi conjunction that we were just looking at. Every 584 days as she passes between us and the sun, each time one of these kisses occurs, so the background stars that are behind, that the sun is in and Venus is in, when this happens every 584 days, it um, it is two-fifths of a circle, two-fifths of the 360-degree circle. So let me just read his sentence without, <laughs> without messing it up. Each time one of these kisses occurs, the Sun, Venus, and Earth line up two-fifths of a circle further around, so a pentagram of conjunctions is drawn, taking exactly eight years. Obviously, he's talking about Earth years. Or 13 Venusian years. Right. So a Venusian year is not 584 days. That 584 days is this synodic period where it From lines up with From our perspective here on Earth, that's the key. Yeah. Um, so we, won't, we, we won't mess mechanics. things up. Yeah. We won't mess things up by talking about Venusian days so, or years. <laughs> but, but Venus going around the sun and coming back to the same point in the sky relative to the sun would be a Venus year. Mm -hmm. So that's different than what we're talking about here. This is a synod or a conjunction or a kazemi. So those 584 day kisses. I love how they call it a kiss. Kazemis <laughs> happen two fifths of the circle each time. So you're going to draw this pentagram that you see in, in the page there every eight years. So it's it's a five-pointed Venus trace and an eight year, so five and eight, and then there's a 13 mm -hmm. from Venus's, from Venus's perspective as it goes around the sun, it's 13 Venus years. So five, eight, 13. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to just mention some of my astrological lovers <laughs> who are following um, will know this as a Venus star point. It's referred to by the work of Ariel Goodman. Um, and uh, the Venus star point occurs in a, um, a different sign for 100 years. So we're just completing one of the Venus star points occurring in Scorpio. And now, um, as of 2022, um, the Venus star point from Scorpio moved into Libra, set to be there repeating every eight years for the next 100 years. So it's going to have these Kazemis, these inferior conjunctions in five different set zodiac signs, zodiac signs mm -hmm. for a hundred year period and then right. it's the the star is very slowly shifting through the zodiac but That's right. it stays in five star uh, signs for five years hundred years so, yes um so back to john martin knows and then we'll continue with 
looking and we'll move towards the Aztec or the Toltec sunstone, which maybe should be called the Venus stone. I think that would be lovely. <laughs> um, we'll get to that. So let me just see what he's saying. Oh, yeah. 13 Venusian years. Note the Fibonacci numbers again. So he's he's already found Fibonacci harmonies in the solar system. Mm. What a coincidence. So Fibonacci numbers are phi numbers, golden ratio numbers. The Fibonacci sequence, you are adding the last number to the next number. So five in the sequence, five is followed by eight is followed by 13 because five plus eight is 13. is 13. And then the next one would obviously be 21 because 13, you take the eight mm -hmm. and add that. And basically what you're doing each time is you're creating a golden section. Mm -hmm. you, you could create a rectangle that has the proportions of eight and five. Very mathematical. And for those of us who aren't mathematical, as I was not, <laughs> it can get quite complex, but it's what most beautiful, uh, it's, it's where we get the beauty and the harmony in the world because most flowers, um, you know, most, most things in nature follow this um, Fibonacci sequence of numbers. The phi ratio is everywhere in nature. It's in our digits. It's in our phalanges. You know, the bone of this longest bone of your finger has a phi ratio to the next longest bone to the next longest bone. It has that proportion in your face. It has it from the top of the head to the chin. That's another. So what's happening here is phi is unfolding in the arrangement and the cycles and the harmonies of the planets. And it is unfolding in, as you just said, flowers. There's that pentagram that Venus is tracing out. But if you look at an apple blossom or a plum blossom or a sunflower or a nautilus shell, you'll find this phi unfolding it's unfolding in our bodies it's unfolding in the mm. universe it's really not a coincidence no and this is why venus is the planet that governs beauty because everything that's beautiful has this uh, this balance this harmony of phi and um and so i just find that absolutely mesmerizing i mean looking here at the beautiful um pentagram and venus cycle um mandela there it's obvious, you know, the, the harmony, the, the, the sinistry, if you like, of, of Venus is beyond beautiful. It's just this, when you start to think about this, it's mind boggling. It's just not a coincidence. It's not an accident. So let me just finish the final sentence that I've outlined in red. The periods of Earth and Venus are also closely related at a relationship of phi to one. Mm -hmm. So. This golden ratio, I won't say any more about that, is just unfolding in the heavens. So now what I want to do is talk a little bit about Venus as the morning star and Venus as the evening star. But I want to show the gears of heaven that the Tychos, the way the Tychos lays them out, because the, the final thing that we saw on that page were a picture of the retrogrades. The retrogrades of Venus down here, that's what we were seeing in the Stellarium. We actually saw mm -hmm. you know, this motion, but you can trace it in the sky and there's some retrogrades. Yeah. Go ahead. And it's the retrograde motions that create that beautiful mandala with the little petals um, that we saw in that beautiful uh, mandala a moment ago. And according to the Tycho's model, which like I said, just this week, I had a four hour conversation, second conversation that I recorded and put up on YouTube with Simon Schack and Patrick Holmquist talking about the Tycho's model. So you can go check that out. But in that, this most recent four hour conversation, we really got into retrogrades and the argument that a retrograde is not, quote unquote, just the earth passing uh, just an optical illusion, which is what you're taught in school. You're taught, first of all, no one's ever taught retrogrades in school, but if you <laughs> but if you were to ask someone who's teaching the conventional model, what is a retrograde? They would just say, oh, that's just an illusion. If we're passing, let's say, on the outside track, we're in the fast lane and Mars 
Mars is going slower. He's Mars on the slow lane, slower than and us. Mars is going slower. Well, Mars is going forward on the freeway, and we're going forward on the freeway, and it always looks like Mars is going forward against the background of trees, except when we pass Mars on the freeway, it's still going forward, but for a little while, it looks like it's going backwards against the trees as we pass it. It's an optical illusion. It keeps going forward. Same thing, Venus is on the inner lane, so it's actually on a faster lane than us. Every now and then, as we're going around, we make this loop when we happen to be passing it on we're on the outside lane and it makes this loop but it's just really just an optical illusion nothing's really changing in the tycos model not so it's actually it's a very intriguing model someone in a comment said when i started to talk about this i explained to people you cannot figure out mars under the conventional model mm. And that is absolutely true. Kepler, who gave us the conventional model, had the biggest battle with Mars. He called it his war with Mars. He couldn't fit Mars into his model. Mm. And eventually, he actually fudged the numbers, as they discovered in yep. 1988. Wait a minute. Kepler was using phony numbers here to try and f shoehorn Mars into his model. That's a better way to start explaining it to people than to jump right into well, and also in this model, the sun is going around the earth and mm. everybody at that point, everybody would turn off, but it's not really the sun going around the earth. It's the sun having a more complicated dance with Mars where earth is in the middle, moving more slowly. I won't get into the whole thing. Go check it out. But I'm going to show that model to show the cycles of the heavens. And I'm going to just turn off. I've got these beautiful traces on. I'm going to turn those off and we're going to roll back to today Boom. so while david's doing that this is something called the tycosium which shows how this other alternative um, scientific view of how our solar system planets are interacting with one another in a different manner than what we've conventionally been taught um, this beautiful computer model created by patrick has um has been is available on the internet just look up tycosium and you can watch the dance of these planets uh, and how they move so beautifully with this other um, this other perspective that, uh, that involves Mars and the Sun in a binary system together with one another. And it may be that we're in a double double. We're a binary system that is like the binary system of Sirius, and we may ourselves, our system may be in a dance with Sirius. I'm so, sure it is. So, so <laughs> we are. It is really fascinating. But as you can see here on the screen there's earth in the center with the moon revolving around it and here's the sun doing its orbit that's mars there and it is as it's going around venus and mercury are going around the sun but the sun is going around basically it's going around the berry center not to get too complex of its dance with mars so the, the Earth looks stationary here, but it's actually doing a very slow circular motion in the midst of this giant spinning hurricane. So I'm going to take the... So you're saying Earth's in the eye of the storm, so Earth's to speak. in the eye of the hurricane. Mm -hmm. and, but it's in a calm, just mm -hmm. like the eye of the hurricane is a calm. Mm -hmm. So that may be, we don't know, but... Simon speculates, well, it may be that a planet stuck in the calm eye of the hurricane may be the place that life can exist, mm. not necessarily on those planets that are out there in the hurricane, yep. uh, whipping around at such Makes sense. a higher speed. So I'm going to take this actually back to today. So we're, I'm going to stop it from running. I'm going to take it back to today. So we're recording this on the 17th of August here in Australia, and I'm gonna back it up. I'm gonna use this step backward function to take it back before August 13th, because that's when Venus went Kazemi. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so that everyone can see what's going on a little. Zoom out a little, there we go. And I'm gonna put the trace on when I get to Kazemi. So let me run a little, um, I'm gonna slow it down to one week. So one second will equal one week. I'm going to take us up to about August 13th. If, so date right there is September 16th. I must have not have gone back. Let me step backward. Okay, so I've taken us back to um, before August 13th. I'm going to run us forward 
to about August 13th, see what I'm doing? There, there's August 13th. So now you can see, if I were to take out a ruler or a straight edge, Venus is flying in front of the sun from our perspective on Earth. We're in a line right here. And as you saw, you know, the angular, the, the declination of Venus above the line between Earth and Sun means that sometimes it Venus, can vary. Yeah, the the they call that a uh, what do they call it when it goes right in front of the the last time was in 2012 when it actually Venus actually makes a, a track across the yeah, face right. of the Sun. Yeah, and I projected it onto a piece of paper when that happened. It was really exciting. I don't think it's going to happen again until I. Can't remember. I'd need to yeah, look it up. Yeah. It's a very rare occurrence that we have a, the Sun and Venus at the exact declination when they are Kazemi. So now what I'll do, I'm, I've put on the trace function. Starting on that Kazemi, I'm going to run it, and now watch what's happening. Let me see. There, yeah. So you can see Venus is leaving a little dot every few days or mm -hmm. few weeks as it moves around. What's happening is Venus is orbiting. The Sun, if you look closely, you'll see there's a circle. Venus is orbiting the Sun, but the Sun is making a circle. So <laughs> as Venus goes through the heavens, it's leaving a trace. If Venus, at one point in the book, uh, the whole Tycho's book is online, and Simon at one point says, if you had a cowboy riding a horse and he was spinning a lasso around his head and the lasso had a torch in it the torch would be making a smoke rings this like is this. The, this is the smoke rings so now look there venus just went combust it was behind the sun it was a little bit off the screen i don't have this exactly let me i should probably zoom out just a touch yeah so now you can look this up for yourself if you would like to on the Tychosium if you want to see this um, for yourself as well as all the other cycles of the planets that are listed there too to see the patterns they make it's fascinating but now here what's happening is Venus is still just going around in a circle but what's happening is because Venus is in that lasso and the Sun is the cowboy with the horse it's making an interior loop that is retrograde right there that mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. they're saying Retrograde is not an optical illusion. Retrograde is the actual trace that the planet is making, just like the, the smoke from that lasso, uh, lassoed uh, torch would make in the sky. So now Venus is going to go behind the sun again. It's going to line, it's, it's coming. At this point, Venus would be invisible because it's lost in the sun's glare. Mm -hmm. So this is those. And this is Venus moving behind the sun, doing a combust. Now she's about directly, to be... Directly lining up. Boom, there's the line. And then when she comes out the other side, she will be... Which one? The, the evening star. And let me show you. Now I've made a slide to show you how you can see that. So if I pause it here, here's how you can figure out. I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to slow the Earth down just a bit. One second equals one day. So now the Earth is turning one time around each second. And as you can see, we're looking down on the North Pole. If I zoom really in, you could even see you know, North America, Asia. So what's going on? That's looking down from the north. The east coast of the United States hits the sunshine first because we're mm -hmm. rotating around to the east. New York is about three hours ahead of California, or it is three hours ahead in the time zones of the United States. So what that means is the front edge of the Earth, the eastern edge is going to reveal, that's where the sun is going to rise. So now let me go to my handy slide that I made because you can now think about it. Aha, if the sun, if the Earth is turning this way, which it is because we're looking down at the North Pole, then the Western horizon, the Western horizon, this is, we're turning towards the East. Over time, that Western horizon is going to obscure things. And what's gonna happen is the sun will be obscured by the Western horizon coming around, but Venus will still be visible because Venus is actually 
to the east of the sun in the sky in this configuration. So that would be the evening star. The sun has gone down, but Venus is still above the western horizon because it's actually to the east of the sun. If you think about it, if you're looking west and the sun has gone down, but Venus is still, it's closer to the eastern horizon than the sun was. So it's east of the sun and it's the evening star. Uh, it's very easy to figure this out if you have astrological software as well. You'll be able to determine is, the sun, is Venus going to rise before the sun or um, set after the sun and that determines whether it's a morning or an evening star. But I have shown you that on, uh, on my YouTube videos with the astro wheel on occasion, so I'm not going to go into that. But I'm trying, to, I'm trying to show what's actually like the arrangement that in the gears of heaven, and this is the gears of heaven as argued by the Tycho's model, but it's the same. If, if you want to go with the Copernican model, if, if Venus is to the east of the sun, it'll still be the evening star because it'll still be up when the sun has gone down. Now here we have Venus actually to the west of the sun and you'll see why. So continue to recall that we're rotating that way. So as we rotate that way, the sun will come up when our eastern horizon rotates around and uncovers the sun. The sun will pop up above the horizon. But as you can see, as we rotate that way, when Venus is in this position relative to the sun, Venus will pop up above the horizon before the sun will. On that last line, the sun is still just down below the horizon, so it's getting light in the east, but Venus is well above that line because in this case, Venus is actually west of the sun. So now if you look at the Tychosium, you, we can actually see this, um, and I won't spend too much more time on this, but I think it's really instructive to see, okay, let me, let me see what's going on. Venus disappears behind the sun. Now, as it comes out, it becomes the evening star. And then it goes retrograde, and now it's on the other side of the sun, and it's the morning star, because we're gonna turn and reveal that before the sun. And so that gets us familiar with this Venus cycle that the Aztecs were, and Toltecs were apparently so familiar with it, they were more familiar in many ways than modern, modern astronomy, because they knew this 29.22 day period. So, um, I just showed that. Let me just show. Here's the calendars for what we just went through. And over here in 2023, that's when Venus went Kazemi. It was during that period you could not see Venus. Um, but four days later, Venus begins to rise as the morning star. And I've got the dates that Venus is the morning star in yellow. I used yellow for morning star. And then... It, this was actually, remember how I said it's 263 day on average? This is only 225 days, but it's all averages over centuries. Then it goes invisible as Venus goes behind the sun. For the 50 days. 50 days. And in the middle of that 50 days, I circled June 4th. That's when Venus will be... Combust in exaction. In Venus is in astrology Venus is determined to be combust whenever she's invisible lost in the glare of the Sun and that includes the eight days where she's in front of the Sun um, the only difference is the one day when she's at the exact degree of the Sun that's what we call Kazemi the Kazemi day the rest of the time she is combust and lost in the glare of the Sun I just need to clarify that. Am I being okay. sloppy with my terminology? Not at all, not at all. <laughs> okay. You're being bang on. <laughs> you're, you're, you're adding precision. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's the on the 4th is when the actual superior conjunction or combust point of exact, um, mm. what, what did you call it? So it will be combust for the entire 50 days, but the oh. exact point at the same degree when the Sun and Venus are at the same degree will occur on June the 4th. And then Venus will still be combust and invisible in the glare it's a total of 72 days for this particular okay. period. And then she rises uh, or, or she is seen as the evening star. I put it in blue for the evening star uh, on July 10th and, and goes all the way through 
uh, looks like March 19th, before then going in front of the sun, and then there will be another. So there's 253 days as the evening star. Then there's approximately an eight day period. If you see in between the blue and the yellow there in March of 2025, Venus will disappear from on the 20th, 21st, 27th. That's the period of Kazemi and then rises, uh, it goes all the yeah, it goes all the way to the 25th and so rises as be, the morning it, star again. It will be combust for all the, for, um, there's five days there, for um, four out of those five days, and there will be one day when Venus will be Kazemi, Kazemi on, the on the 23rd, exactly, yeah. in the middle of that process. Um, and anyone could look this up. Yeah. I just tried to, I'm just trying to give us a feel for these cycles before mm -hmm. I rock into the <laughs> sunstone or... And yes. we might want to call it. Got to understand the how Venus, Venus works before we can look at the stones. Now we're all more familiar with it, so now we can finally bring in the Aztec sunstone. So what's really fascinating about this? There's a quote that Simon put in his discussion of the cycles of the Moon, Earth, and Venus, and he's talking about how the moon cycle of 29.22 days perfectly fits into the average Venus cycle of 584.4 days. Let me just put a quick footnote before anyone says, wait a minute, it's not 484.4, it's 483.9, because I looked at an <laughs> ephemeris from 1900 to 2050. I looked at 94 periods from 1900 to 2050 and averaged them up and it came to 583.9 but Simon showed that if you look over a extremely long period it comes to 584.4 and apparently the Aztecs knew that which is pretty mm, remarkable so the 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 average the 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 distance between the days is different each time. It basically goes between 580 and 588, but it averages out to 584. You saw that in the little book of coincidence. He used 584. Mm -hmm. Simon argues it's 584.4, and what's remarkable about that is that's exactly 20 moon cycles of 29.22. Mm -hmm. So now it's all coming together, and he cites the work of Doug Bundy, who wrote a paper called The Aztec Sunstone is Not Aztec and It's Not a Sunstone. Mm -hmm. And Doug Bundy wrote this and he said, it's not a sunstone, it's actually keyed to the moon and Venus. Mm -hmm. And it's not Aztec, it's actually Toltec and the Aztecs even admitted that. And the Aztecs talked about the Toltecs, they were like the founders, the builders. So. Um, you know, in ancient Egypt, they talked about the sons of Horus, mm. the Shemshu Hor. That is kind of like these legendary god-like figures, the Toltecs. But the Toltecs gave us this sunstone, or maybe it should be called the Moonstone slash Venus Stone. And Doug Bundy, actually building off the work of a woman named um, Lucille Hansen. L. Taylor Hansen was her name. She wrote in the 19... 60s a book called he walked the americas and she's arguing that all these legends of viracocha are that graham hancock talks about in fingerprints of the gods obviously fingerprints of the gods was 30 years later in mm -hmm. 1995 she wrote this in the 60s and she's writing it from a christian perspective saying well that was actually jesus over here and they called him the morning star the bright morning star venus and, and Viracocha, there were these Viracocha figures, and those Viracocha figures were Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha. They were associated with Venus, the morning star. There's, you know, Maya texts and Aztec records that show that he's associated with the morning star. So she's arguing, oh, that's, that's actually Jesus. No, this is all part of an ancient worldwide system. We won't get too into that right now, but they apparently knew... 29.22 days, 584.4 days, and they incorporated all in this amazing calendar. So let me show you what Doug Bundy, are, and he's also arguing it from 
what I would call a literalist Christian perspective. Actually, he's uh, arguing it from a Latter-day Saints Mormon perspective uh, and saying, oh, this, this calendar is showing the end of another cycle and, you know, you better pay attention. Come and join the Latter-day Saints as quick as you can, okay, basically. He does, he does say that. But, um, but I'm really we don't endorse that. <laughs> but I'm really grateful that he uh, did the work to explain how he sees this calendar working. Mm-hmm. And then Simon quoted just a little small piece of it as because Simon is showing, yeah, the Aztecs or the Toltecs, the Central American star watching wisdom keepers knew these cycles and they knew they were interconnected and it's fascinating. So let me walk you through this uh, because I kind of became a little bit intrigued by it and wanted to figure it out. Just a tad. <laughs> and so that's why we're talking about this today because this, the significance of these cycles. And it's Venus retrograde at the moment. So we've just had Kazemi, so it's very timely. Yes. <laughs> that's, I mean, this just got me intrigued. So let's take a look at what's going on in here. So he starts off, well, I'm going to start off. This is the way I'm going to explain it. There are these glyphs on this inner ring. So there's five, there's a five figure glyph in the center of this that we're going to talk about in a minute. But first we're going to talk about this inner ring. And on this inner ring are 20 glyphs and they're going around in a counterclockwise fashion. And these are the day glyphs of the Aztec calendar and the Maya calendar. They had a base 20 cycle a base 20 cycle and in this case it's arranged in a counterclockwise fashion and it actually starts at the top with these 20 glyphs and these day glyphs Doug Bundy argues are actually well they're they're months of the the moon so Mm -hmm. what is what he's arguing is that they're using this to track 20 moons rather than 20 days because 20 moons is going to get you a Venus cycle and and we'll see in a moment as we go through but Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put the names of all the 20 days up here it starts off with the crocodile glyph uh, Sipakli and then comes a Hecatl that's I believe the wind then comes Kali these glyphs that stands for the house these were the names of the days in the Maya calendar and the Aztec calendar. We'll just go all the way around. Coatl, that's uh, a snake. That's the symbol for death. That's a symbol for actually a deer. Here comes a rabbit. And Adol, that's an interesting one. That means water. So what's really interesting is Atlantis <laughs> uses, the, I mean, the Aztec word, the na, the Nahuatl word or the Nahua word for water, Adol, is related to our word Atlantic and Atoll. Atlantis and it's really interesting. Mm. Um, continuing around, I'll just, um, oh, that's, uh, I don't remember what each one is. Oh, Akadol is an aloe plant or sometimes it's called a reed. That one's important because there's an actually an Akadol glyph at the top of this wheel that we're going to look at a little bit later, but that's Akadol. It's actually like a big uh, sacred aloe plant, which was mm-hmm. sacred to the Nahua and the Aztec. This one is ocelotl, which is a jaguar. We know the word ocelot. Mm-hmm. This is an interesting one. Uh, Kawat, uh, Kawatli and then Kozkawatli. So Kawatli is an eagle and Kozkawatli is a condor or a vulture. Ah, oh, right. Vultures are, are very interesting. Mm. Um, mythical and symbolic animal. This is Olin, and some people say that's the glyph that's in the center as well. Olin means movement or quaking or an earthquake. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's uh, Takpatli. Oh, this one is also very interesting to me. This is Quiyawidal. Uh, uh, Quiyawidal is the wind. Quiyawidal. Yahweh. Yahweh. That name Yahweh is... Which is like the, breath. The, and that's the mm. sacred name of, of the, Yahweh, of Yahweh mm. Jehovah. And he is a wind God. You can mm. see it throughout the scriptures. 
So it's very interesting, interesting, these linguistic connections and patterns around the world. And then it finishes off with the flower, Zoshtli. So those are the 20 moon glyphs, or they're actually day glyphs, but in Doug Bundy's argument, which I find fascinating, he says they're using it to count the months to of get the moon to between a Venus, Venus cycle. To mm, yeah, to so get to a Venus cycle. So 20 moon. 29.22 day months will get you one Venus year. So mm. if this is correct, it's a Venus stone and you can keep track by by naming the different moon months by you know around wow. in this pattern. Wow. So let's go I'd ahead. love to know the astrological correspondences that these moons have um, and I guess the names would have a lot of it in it a lot of that um, correspondence in it such as um, you know the Yahweh type one with the breath and, um, and it's the wind. It's really interesting mm. isn't it? I, mm. I'm not an expert. I do have a couple chapters on the myths of mainly the Maya from the um, Popol Vuh in my book Ancient Worldwide System but this would be a, a fascinating area to just dive into more research. deeply. It's, it's very fascinating. So here now we'll talk about the inner so this is the part of the aztec sunstone so-called aztec sunstone that gets the most attention if you look it up in wikipedia or if you look up articles from you know various people explaining it to you they'll say well this is the four ages or the four suns and now we're in the fifth sun and the fifth sun will come to an end the ages the idea of ages over the you know, golden age, silver age, like in the Yuga cycle. Like the Kali Yuga, right. etc. Mm -hmm. So the destruction of a sun, they call them the, the different suns. There's a jaguar sun, there's a and and each destruction, one was a destruction by water, one was a destruction by fire. So this is common in the myths of the world. We have in the Bible, you know, there's the flood of Noah and then in the New Testament Actually, in the book attributed to Peter, it says, well, the next one will be by fire. These are, I have argued, not actual literal destructions of the world. This is actually about the shifting of the procession, the ages, mm. the celestial ages, which relates to why we have um, tropical astrology versus right. sidereal astrology. It's the shifting. We won't get too into that, but this is normally explained as, well, this whole sunstone is to uh, count how long till we get to the end of an age. Maybe it is. I'm not debating that that's true, but they may have been counting it. This is what Doug mm -hmm. Bundy argues, and he bases that on this, on some footnotes in this other book about the sunstone. They were figuring out the ages by following the cycles of Venus, and then this five, so it's a pattern. It's got these four different glyphs for the ages. There's four jaguar, etc. And as you go around, there's this fifth point in the center and also a fifth face in the center. And he, the fifth face in the center actually has two hands kind of like in um, mm. gripping fashion on either side, but it's a five glyph. Now, remember, we looked at Venus cycle is this five-pointed five star. What's really intriguing is if we've got 20 glyphs and then now we've got a five-pointed star, that could argue for five Venus years because we just saw that, um, and not I shouldn't actually say five Venus years, I should say five Venus kisses or mm -hmm. five Venus That's Kazimis, a nice way to phrase it, yeah. Eight Earth years, mm. eight Earth years. And what's really intriguing, and Doug Bundy points this out, is you've got this five glyph in the center and then you've got eight points around here. There's one, see these triangular points? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's your eight and five on the same ring. So it's mm. implying, according to Doug Bundy's argument, that we're talking about a five, eight that are the same. Well, what's the same that's five and eight? It's five Venus kisses or Kazemis and eight Earth years. Mm -hmm. So here we have in this Venus stone or sunstone or whatever you want to call it, an eight and a five. There's also, uh, and I'm Go just ahead. noticing this, um, in the central, you've got it marked as five Venus 
years, five little icons there. Um, but there's also eight because there's two on either side of of the red um, mm -hmm, the symbology you've got. You've got yeah, two claws two hands, yeah. and then there's the one at the bottom sitting at the mm -hmm. underneath. So that makes eight yeah. as well. You're messing up my whole argument. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm trying to like just lay out. I'm just trying to lay out <laughs> Doug Bundy's argument in like the most clearest way. Yes. And I don't know if he's right sorry or not. Sorry for mucking it up. No, I think he's right. I think he's right, and you're right. That could be one, two, three, five, and then the three spaces, six, seven, eight. So it in, it ingeniously meshes five and eight it does and it's everywhere five and eight everybody. and then and there's a 13 at the top so up here oh and just i put this in 13 times uh, i think i've got my i've got my animation a little bit out of order but don't pay attention to the the orange or yellow text at the top just yet <laughs> if you want to see that 365.2422 days per year for earth times eight years, how many days does that add up to? It's 2,921.94 days. And that is 2922 days, and that is your 100 months. So that's five cycles around the, the blue ring of the 20. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. five times 20. So we got five Venus years do add up to eight Earth years. I just put in the math so people could see it. Cool. And then eight, five, and 13 at the top, there's this glyph which is an acidal glyph with 13 little discs around it. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger, but that is the symbol for 13 acidal, which remember is an aloe plant, or they, they sometimes just call it a reed, 13 reed, like a writing reed, like a reed that grows in the swamps. And there it is. It's, it's a little fuzzy, but I blew it up to make it a little bit bigger. It's it's a picture of an aloe, and then it's got these 13 circles around it. I'll just count them up for everyone to see. There's 13 balls basically arra arranged around this aloe. Ooh, I might have just clicked too many times. Let's see what happens. Nope, that worked out. Okay, so he argues that this 13 acidal up here is to tell you, well, we have to multiply 13 times this 13 times 5 Venus years or 13 times 8 Earth years, and that's going to give us the next ring on this stone. So all the way around, there's 40 of these little dice-shaped symbols. It's called a quincunx. It's a Roman word, but it's... We use quincunx in astrology. It's, oh. a, it's an aspect. I didn't know that. Yeah, the 40-degree aspect. Well, that's perfect mm -hmm. because... Um, it's like a dice so or you know if you take a, a die mm -hmm. or a pair of dice and you roll double fives which mm. would be what what's double fives called there's there's like nicknames for snake all these snake size i don't know um, <laughs> is that don't know. Uh, snake eyes is double ones <laughs> double fives is something good anyway um those five the five dots on a on the five side of a dice mm -hmm. are arranged in this quick quinkunx mm -hmm. pattern and there's 40 of those there's 20 on each side. So there's, if you look, the the ring that I've 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 circ I've I've outlined one of the five pointed um, die shapes. There's 10 in each of those sections. If you look around there, and so this would be 52 years each because if you have 13 times eight Earth years. Now I'm counting in Earth years, not. Mm -hmm. Venus years, 52 years or um, 8 times 13, and each pair of these would be 104 years. So each section, like between my green circle that says 1 and the green circle that says 7, there's 10 of these little quincunxes or 5 sets. So each set is going to be 104 years so it's 52 years each and again we got to that by going 13 times 8 that's 52 now we're going to count them in pairs and so if you go around 
While you're doing that, I just need to clarify, quincunx in astrology is 150 degrees, not 40, as oh. I mentioned earlier. Sorry. Okay, but it's cool. <laughs> I got you're, carried I away with my excitement well, over I didn't there, know so. quincunx was in <laughs> astrology, so I never heard of quincunx until I read Doug Bundy's paper mm -hmm. about, I, I mean, I knew that there's, that's, that's the way you arrange five dots on a side of a die, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that that was called a quincunx. So anyway, each pair is... 104 years so I'm now counting around you can see I started up near the top of the I'm counting the number of pairs there's one two I did them in alternating colors three four so people could kind of keep track and then five and so each quadrant of this disc is going to be 520 years each right so then we get to a total of four quadrants overall, and that's going to add us up to, of course, 1,040 years on either side. And you can see there's a serpent. If you look on the outer ring, the left side ends in a serpent at the very bottom, a feathered serpent, a plumed serpent with actually a human face coming out of his mouth. And on the right side, there's another serpent with a human face coming out. Each side is 1040 years. So the whole count is going to be 2,080 years total and so you can get to that with 20 pairs of 13 times 8 years each 20 pairs that I just counted out 20 pairs of 104 earth years and so Doug Bundy says it's as if if we wanted to reproduce this in a much simpler way to count out 104 years at a time you could arrange he shows this grid pattern and I just show it here to so that if you read Doug Bundy's paper now you'll understand what he's talking about because it, it took me a little while to figure out what's he talking about so he's saying that each of these squares on this on this matrix this grid is eight years so each is eight years so that is five Venus kisses five Kazemis I shouldn't call it Venus years because that could get confused with a Venus orbit. Five Venus kisses, Kazemis, interior mm -hmm. conjunctions, um, or eight Earth years per square. So each column will then be 13 acadal, or 13 times eight Earth years, 104 Earth years. And then we've got four quadrants of those on the Toltec Sunstone, one pair per column. And so each quadrant of the sunstone is 520 years 520 years each quadrant and so you could think of this as you know the aztec priests or wisdom keepers or venus watchers and moon watchers could just use this they could have made a nice matrix like this that Doug Bundy came up with, or they could have made something beautiful like this Toltec Venus yeah. stone to count. Okay, well we we just we just did five, we just did twenty moons, which adds up to a one Venus Kazemi, and then twenty moons, another Venus, and when we do five of those, then we cross off and we do that all the way down, and then we're counting out this period. And so. Um, I just made these little X's. You know, you could think of it as each time you go through eight of those, you get. And this is actually a drawing that was done in 1792. So oh, wow. this Toltec stone was buried before the conquistadors arrived. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't dig it up until 1790. And this is a very early drawing of it, a very accurate drawing of it. You can actually see mm. the 13 mm. acadol at the top. You can see the um, the serpents down at the bottom, the serpent heads down at the bottom of the human faces coming out. And this was uh, drawn almost immediately. And I think it took a little while for it to get published, but this was published just two years after it was unearthed again. So beautiful. Yeah. And, and that's basically the end of my presentation. Um, I just wanted to show mm. the the argument is the Aztec or the Toltec or whoever we want to attribute this stone to, Aztecs, Toltecs, the Central American civilizations understood the 2922 
number, mm -hmm. which is a very accurate number according to Simon Shack's calculations, and the 584.4, and then the 5 and the 8, and they made this beautiful counter, mm -hmm. and it was counting out these cycles for some reason. Does that have something to do with actual events on Earth? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying the cycles of the heavens are important. Mm, so important. Everywhere around the world, they paid attention to them. Mm. The ancient knowledge seems to be more accurate than the modern knowledge. That's correct, yeah. And it's not a coincidence. These these are these harmonies are just beautiful. What I love is important. that what we're looking at here is the interaction between Venus and the moon cycles, mm. the two feminine planets in astrology, and how they are interacting with the other feminine planet that we don't often refer to, which is Gaia, Mother Earth. Earth. So this is the this is the alignments the, between Moon, Earth, and Venus, mm. and and they appear to be this stone features those three that's it. feminine that's entities, right. the feminine interaction, the feminine dance of the the three of us. <laughs> and they're so harmonic, and they're so harmonic. Yeah. And and when you start to see this, then it starts to make more sense when an astrologer tells you. <laughs> Well, Venus is going retrograde, and that may have an impact on human lives here on Earth. Under the, you know, kind of materialistic and mm. uh, random model that we're given, where they argue, well, there's no connections between anything. Everything is just coincidental. It's it, doing it its own thing, and, you know, sometimes they cross over and sometimes they don't. The, the model says, well, nothing is connected. But mm. as we're seeing, the period of the moon is intimately connected with the period of Venus mm -hmm. and the period of Venus is intimately connected with the period of Earth mm -hmm. and and those retrogrades are not just an optical illusion they are these actual loops and it loops before it goes Kazemi or yeah. you know it's just amazing it's amazing and it's beautiful and I love this discovery of Doug Bundy's because I think that that's just I love the the mandala that is the the sunstone um but it's gorgeous that it's got so much more depth through his research and and simon's and patrick's tycosium mm. helps us understand why mandalas have you know mandalas around the world have these kind of trochoidal patterns they and do. loops and arches and they're reflecting the motions of the heavens so yeah. i just thought it was It'd be fun to explore those cycles Now I want to try together. and understand each of those moon phases because I think there'd be some significance in that for the, the, the series of moons that we go through following on from Kazemi to Kazemi. Um, no, it can't have any impact on us. On uh, you moon. don't think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to research that. <laughs> Join me for moon reports. <laughs> that was fascinating. Mm. And thank you so much for being here i'm so pleased that we did that mm. examination together because it would have been dry and boring if i tried to <laughs> tried to explain it out and i would have missed all those insights that you Mucked brought you out no no it didn't <laughs> mock me up i was joking that was great <laughs> thank you <laughs> thanks thanks everyone for joining us start counting moons mm. and paying attention to venus cycles moons and venus and <laughs> We'll see you next time. <laughs>